rough guesstimate, 100 million. You pick a number and it could it could exceed whatever you think. Take 120 motherboards, and they also wanted me to take a specialist in there with me who would download data from the, the mainframe drives. We had JP Morgan, RBS. We had some of the leading banks in England and America. The motherboards were worth in excess of 5 million, if not more. It's probably one of the biggest uh, complexes in, in England at that time of data protection. It was deemed one of them jobs that was just impossible. As we got down towards uh, Verizon, about 200 yards away, the old bill came behind us and the sirens went off. What's going on guys and welcome back to the Blue Tick Show. Opposite me today, I've got Terry Ellis, the man that stole millions from Verizon. Some say 5 million, some say 10 million, some say 100 million. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here, Michael. So how many millions did you steal? Well, we sold 5 million pounds worth of pendant and chips um, and just over 100 million pounds worth of data, if not more. 100 million? Yeah. So you got quite a few bucks behind you then, yeah? You know, I had to go no comment for that one. <laughs> well, listen, welcome to the show. And before I even had you on here, I said, your story is probably one of the most exciting stories I've ever had on here because it's something I'm interested in. I want to know how you stole hundreds of millions from probably one of America's biggest data companies. Yeah, um, I, th I think Verizon holds data for um, some of the leading banks in America and England, such as JP Morgan. Before we dive into that whole story, I want to dive into a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing. And then we'll dive into how you actually got commissioned to do the job. Okay. Um, well, I was I was born in Camden Town. Um, I, so I, I was probably sort of a feral kid around there. You know, the same as all the other kids. Uh, it, the place was a uh, was um, like a gold mine of, for, of activity as far as being able to go out and earn money. You know, there was lots of factories in um, in Camden Town and Kings Cross. And I spent my 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 childhood just just going into warehouses at night, robbing them. <laughs> Uh, and then getting what we wanted, whether it was jeans, shoes, toys, food. We went out, well, you know, we, I, I came from a relatively poor family. Uh, my dad was a black cab driver, but he didn't live with us. And my mum was a single parent and there was four kids. So You I had spent, to do what you had to do. Yeah, to. so I just spent most of my time going out as a young kid, eight, nine years old, uh, going out and just earning money. Well, listen, I think most people I've had on here say when they come from single mum, people do what they got to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely. can't. You, yeah. And back then, it was a lot easier to make money than it is now. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, it wasn't uh, the alarm systems we got now or, or, or the, the fast responses that we had. But, you know, even even then, they, they did used to get there and they did used to chase us. <clears throat> and and we did, uh, you know, I can remember I, I used to, I used to do it on the trains, you know, back in King's Cross. Yeah. They used to have all the trains that used to come past. And I remember sitting there and, and seeing all the cars come past, and they, these, these trains are about a mile, two miles long. They seemed they used to go on forever. And um, I remember, you know, get, getting my pal together, and we used to jump on the trains, run along and jump on the train. And we had four or five uh, black bags, and we would just go along and take the, the stereos out of the cars. And we would go two or three miles down the, 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 uh, the road or, or yeah, down yeah. the tracks, and we would just drop the, the bags off as we went along. And then we get to a certain point where we, we think, well, we really got to get off now. And then we would jump off and uh, we'd walk back and pick them up. And Collect we'd, all the bags. all the cab drivers or people that wanted uh, stereos. So you was always a little bit of a, a naughty boy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, I always had a, a predisposition towards criminality <laughs> growing up. You know, I, you know, I acted on a completely different level to most people my age. Um, because I always saw criminality as an opportunity to challenge myself. Um, and as I got older... You know, and the, the the sort of stuff I was doing became more complex. Um, you got bigger I, and bigger, yeah, of course. It's, I think it's one of the reasons why I really wanted to take the art of robbery to the next level, uh, which meant for me just using my intellect, uh, no guns or any incredulous violence. That's but, what I was going to say. The thing, the difference with you is you was you went and stole millions, but you never yeah. hurt no one. I believe no, no. you was never into violence. No, no. You know, for me, it was about putting together a team of like-minded guys like myself. Um, uh, men who you know were, were the best of the best, you know, Premier League robbers. Men who. Uh, and how do you scout a group of people like that? Well, you know what, you know, I was looking for for a team of guys. You know, uh, these guys had to be proficient, professional, but more importantly, highly motivated, and able to work under extreme conditions. Uh, these uh, men with tenacity um, to overcome their darkest fears of fight or flight, which is a very rare commodity within the British criminal underworld. However, thank God for me, like attracts like. Uh, and eventually we, we came together to pull off uh, s some really big jobs um, and Verizon in particular was uh, was a, was a, was quite a big one you know was that the first job you done as a team do you know as you know as as I, as I said before you know there's, there's uh, being a criminal 
Um, we, we really can't really speak about uh, jobs that we have got away with. Of course. Um, uh, as far as I'm going to say is that we came together for this one job, um, <laughs> but I've known these guys for a very, very long time. So let's just say you've done just a Verizon job for, just a Verizon, for this, yeah. this case here. Talk to us how did people hire you to do the job? Yeah, um, in 2007, um, I, I was approached by an underworld fixer who, who um, fixes jobs on behalf of a, a, a very select clientele. In this case, he told me it was uh, uh, it was a consortium of bankers or people within the banking industry yeah. that wanted us to go in into Verizon and, and retrieve a load of data uh, on behalf of, of uh, some very important people. Um, at that time, we had, um, in 2008, just before 2008, uh, there was a lot of information uh, inside these data processing facilities that could probably put a lot of people away, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. So we were hired. Um, so yeah, so I, I was, I was, I was, um, I was approached, and and they said that uh, Verizon is in Kings Cross, and I knew Verizon. It was a, it was a big. It's building. massive. The name is yeah. massive anyway. It's probably one of the biggest uh, complexes in in England at that time of data protection. Um, it it was probably one of the, it had one of the state of art the art um, security. Um, um, security systems, systems. Um, and I'll just, I'll just go through uh, what, it, what it had you know so when, I, when they offered it to me I know, I know that a few of the guys uh, over the years have looked at it and it was deemed one of them jobs that was just impossible um, the place was as big as um, Buckingham Palace it was a big facility um, 10 security guards um, it had a, um, a perimeter so security perimeter it had a, a, a 24 hour rolling patrols had um, overlapping cameras that could see uh, clear yeah, yeah. as night as day, and then it had a biometric entry system as a keypad, uh, and also, also a card. And once you get into the into that uh, past the first door, you then go into a, a thermostatic pressurized compartment, which is about about 15 foot long by about eight nine foot wide. And what happens? You go through one door that pressurizes uh, and releases the door. You, both doors can't open simultaneously. Yeah. So you have, one has to shut. So you, you, we get into the, into that the compartment, and there's a security guard in a foyer, he, he, behind a bulletproof glass. He then um, you then go into that foyer. He then gives you a, a card, and you go for a, a biometric turnstile. And beyond that point is a metal door, uh, and just behind that door is, is is an access point to a CCT camera suite with three. This is actually something guards. out of a movie. I swear to God, yeah. this is. So when I when I when I when I was when I was given this information of of, of thing, how are we going to circumnavigate this? I thought oh, this is crazy. Plus there was there was three uh, police stations within within a mile vicinity. And how how big is your team at this point? So my team is five guys. It's me and four other guys. And did you go and get more people for this job, or was yeah, that? Yeah, it? I had to. Yeah, when I when, once I got the the specs on it and uh, and looked at it and 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 once they told me what they wanted us to do, so the, so the, the what they wanted me to do was um, take 120 motherboards. Um, and they also wanted me to take a specialist in there with me who would download uh, data from the uh, mainframe drives. You know when you get a job like this, so a guy comes to you and says, Terry, this is a job, X, Y, Z. It's your job to come up with a plan or it's their job and you just go in and do what you've been told. My job is, is, to, is to find a way in there, the best possible way in there without, without triggering any alarms or anything else. Um, yeah, they, you know, they, 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 they gave me certain information. One of the most critical bits of information that I received, after all that, um, that security procedure going in, there was also a private security company monitoring the motherboard room and the data servers. So it was an independent security company yeah, yeah. monitoring them from a different facility. So yeah, so anyone else would, would have looked at that and realised it was just it was a crazy thing to do. It was impossible. And, and you know, many times I've, I've asked, well, why did you do that? You have to be f***ing mad. You know, and, and there's a little bit of madness in us um, as criminals ready to actually make our mark. So, so. You, you got given a job? Yeah. Took it straight away or you thought, nah, f*** this? No, you know what, I, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to have a chat with my guys, I'll have a look at it. And, and But before I do that, I, you know, I need to have some, some money up front uh, to go and buy some, I needed to go and buy a van. I brought a, a British telecom van mm -hmm. so we could, we could plot up outside it in strategic places. So we spent, I spent three weeks uh, looking at it. But first of all, I went, and, I went and had a chat with my guys. All of them said, no, it's impossible. This is a, fucking, this is a nightmare. It's not going to be able to do this. There's, there's, there's too many variables. You know, you couldn't ram it. You can't use guns. Yeah. Uh, as, as I said, there's three police stations with a mild vicinity. So that's Albany uh, Police Station, uh, uh, Highbury and Islington, um, and, and uh, Holmes Road. And also, uh, just across the road, you've got King's Cross. And they've got um, the transport police uh, headquarters there as well. 
So any any scream up, they'd have been there within within three yeah. or four minutes. You know, uh, thirty seconds uh, for the for the rolling patrols that would have been in there as well. So yeah, it was deemed an impossible job. You had to be crazy. And what what obviously you done it, but we, what was the amount you was given from the the team? How much did they say you was going to earn? As a team, do you know what we? You know, we've never really sort of spoken about how much we we receive from this. No, um, but how much was you told you would earn? Oh, like, we, when he come to you and said the job, I'm guessing they come and say, Terry, we're going to pay you there's five a, there's mil. A, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's there's um there's enough money to last last you and your guys, uh, or <laughs> you could get on on with a good a good future together. Okay. So you know, it's, it's you know, it, it was it was an hour's work. We had to be in there for one hour. Uh, so for me, for me, it was just a really it was just a normal job. You know, on, on on paper and and statistically and and what everyone thought was impossible, um, but you know, for us it was a challenge. You know, I, I remember because uh, you know, one of my guys is ex army. He's really good. Uh, all the others they were quite fit guys. I won six foot four. They're all capable guys. So you know, they was all up for the same challenge. And and we spent we spent three weeks looking at it. And after three weeks, we came to the same conclusion that it was impossible. Um, it clearly wasn't. Yeah, you know what? I was actually going to. I was actually on my way to actually speak to the fixer uh, that evening and tell him that you know what? We've looked at this. We've we've <laughs> we've, been out, we've been out there night and day for the last three weeks in the back of a van. Uh, we know how many security guards are, but it's just really an impossible situation to get in there without being seen from the street, being seen from the cameras, because the CCT camera suite, even though it was in a secure uh, location inside the building, they all had panic buttons as well. So we had to circumvent all these procedures to get in there. And if one of them uh, got, got wind of it, we'd have been fucked. So it's, you know? it's practically impossible. Yeah, so it was really just coming up with a, with a solution. To and blend in, I'm guessing. Yeah, so for me, it was, it was, it was just a I, you know, bit of luck from my part. You know, I was driving over West Hampstead. And, and um, as I was drove, driving up West Hampstead towards the library there, there was, they, they'd shut off all the roads. And there was, there was old Bill everywhere. And I, and I went, I, I sort of pulled up to the old, old, old Bill and said, what's going on? He said, oh, there's someone up on the roof. Uh, you've got to wait here until we get him down. You know, we can, you can't drive through. So I said, all right, no problem. So I reversed and f***ed off. And as I was driving down the road, I thought, you know what? That's probably a really good idea because I'm seeing loads of old Bill. I'm seeing loads of people looking at the old Bill, looking up on the, up, uh, up at this guy. They're all busy. And thinking, you know what? I've just, I think I've just found out a move to get in here. But we know, is, you know, for us, it was all, all about authenticity. It's all it's about coming up with a move that would, would would allow us to get all the way through every single uh, security procedure without actually someone setting the alarm off or pressing the panic button. And we did, we came up with a, with a way that evening. So talk to us, talk to us through how you, how you broke into Verizon. Um, well, so what, what we decided was to go as a, a fast response robbery squad. Okay. So, um, but also, it, um, he had to be, we had, we had to have the, the, the vans, we had to have a police van, police car. Um, we also decided that we, to make it really authentic, we would then get an Alsatian uh, and have a dog handlers unit with us as well. So I think we were the first people on mainland England, uh, you know, or anywhere in Europe to actually take a dog on a job, <laughs> you know, which is crazy. <laughs> but, you know, so, but, you know, when I, when, I, when I spoke to my guys and said, like, you know, I, I think this is the way we're going to do it, they had their sort of reservations about, you know, whether we should do it. But you know what, by the end of the evening, we thought, you know what, it's plausible, if we get all the right gear, and we got we had comms as well. I, I reckon it's doable. I see. I'm I'm in. I'm in. My pal said he's in, and then all of a sudden everyone went, "Yep, yeah, I'm in." Bum bum bum. Uh, and then over the next uh, week or so, or, or five days, because we had a week left to get in there, I then went went to the fixer and said, "Like, you know, we we we're going to do it, but I'm not going to tell you what day it is. Yeah. But I want your guy on standby, the the guy who's going to come in, the specialist. specialist. And I sort of uh, some tech guys to actually take all the motherboards out. Yeah. So we arranged to meet the tech guys and we had a little discussion with them. We said that we're going to meet them at a certain place. We never told them about the job or where it was. We said, we'll meet you in Highgate. We, you need to be there at this time. And then we're going to take you from there to another place. We're going to plot you up. We're going to, over, we're going to take over the whole building um, and then we're going to call you in. And they were happy with that. So it was a minimal part for them. Um, we also would arrange to meet the fixer at uh, Highgate as well. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just behind them. So it was, it was going to be like a little convoy. So I remember we left. We left uh, our warehouse. It was about forty minutes away from from uh, Highgate, um, and we just went. We had a van, the dog, and the car. Two in the car, um, and us three. As me, me as, as a passenger, my mate driving, and, and the dog handler in the back with an old station. This video is sponsored by Cranbrook Law, an award-winning immigration law firm. Their talented solicitors can help when. 
any struggles arise regarding immigration law. They can help get you the visas they need. They can help get you the staff you need from any other countries. As you can see, the website is on the screen right now. So if you need anything to do with immigration law, message Cranbrook Law and let them help you. Whether you're looking to obtain a sponsor license, receive advice and guidance in relation to compliance and our civil penalties, or take advantage of our know-how and experience across a broad range of business visas, our talented and dynamic immigration lawyers are available to speak to you. Telephone numbers on the screen, emails on the screen, and hit the link in the bio if you need any help. We, we drove to Highgate and then we asked the guys to get in. I, I had, a, I had a radio comms and said, right, get, get in behind us. And then the, 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 the specialist guy who was going to get the data, he, he got in behind them. And then our car was at the back. So we had, a, we had three cars and a van going down there. And as, as we came to Kentish Town, we just came level with um, McDonald's and there's, a, there's a, um, a crossing there. And just as we were just about to drive past, a uh, 12 bill came onto the crossing. And I always remember, I just looked at them and, and they went like that. And they both went, all right. And one of them went like that. And, and my mate said, for fuck's sake, what are you doing? I said, listen, if, if, if they believe that we're old building, we're on the way there, bro. You know, so he said, like, you know, let's, let's go. So we drove on. And then as we got down towards uh, Verizon, uh, about 200 yards away, uh, the, the tech guys pulled over, the specialist guy pulled over. And as we went to pull over onto the, onto the, uh, the there's, a, there's a 40, uh, 40 foot, uh, gap between the road and and the, the, the entrance the old bill came behind us and the sirens went off <laughs> so so everyone's like uh, everyone's like looking behind what's Fine. going on what's going on what's going on all i could hear on the mic was what's going on from my power in the back of the van i said it's all right it's, it's only there's one old bill i can see him clearly there's only one old bill he wouldn't pull us over if if he was yeah, on, yeah. on our case the next thing he's come around is from but we overshot the mark so now we had to go around again yeah so we had to drive so, so they was already there the other guys the tech guys they stayed where they was i told them to stay where they were and then we drove we drove around but we allowed we had allowed 50 minutes or 50 minutes to actually do the job and 10 minutes to get out mm -hmm. um but but now we were behind we were going to be behind the schedule because in this place uh, when you when you when you know the, the psychology of most uh, security uh procedures they have to they have to uh, go and sign on that's a sort of clock on all the different parts of the building and that takes an hour you okay. know when you're going around if that doesn't happen then the bell then the alarm goes off and then the old the old bill are scattered from everywhere they're coming so so we you know we didn't want to we we needed one hour we allowed one hour and, and now we were going to be three or four minutes behind by going back around mm -hmm. but you know all our adrenaline was flowing we was all up um and then we, we did that, that three minutes and driving around was probably for us the, the, the bit that was the worst probably. because we had already resigned ourselves to going on this job. Now we have to reset ourselves and then go back again. But I think it done us a world of good because our adrenaline was flowing by the time we hit the front door. So we, 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 we come around again, pulled across the van, we pulled across the main entrance and the car came from behind us. All of us got out with our uniforms on. Um, we all had jackets and caps and, and then that dog handler came. So visually you look the part. we looked apart we we were a fast response robbery squad mm -hmm. and i buzzed the entrance and, and the head of security came with three of them so what's going on so we had reports of someone on the roof um so we're going to come in and search the building uh open us open the door and with that we just looked at him and he just buzzed us in and then we went through for all the different procedures boom, boom, and boom, he let you through everything everything and then we and then as we when we got to the cct camera sweep i didn't i didn't turn around to the head of security and said open the door so he opened the door and said, like, has any of your guys been up on the roof? And he said, he said, no. I said, have you seen any, anyone dressed as a security guard up on the roof? He went, no. I said, well, the person that, we're, that we've had the report about is dressed as a security guard. He was climbing up the side of the building. Uh, so for my protection and my officer protection, I'm going to have to cuff everybody in here. So stand up. And then all of a sudden they all stood up. I thought, lovely. So them three came out. We cuffed them on, in the stairwell. The, three, the, three, the other three security guards, we cuffed them. And then what we did, we looked on the CCT camera and then we, we, we asked the security guard to call them down one at a time. And as they came down, we just wrapped, wrapped them up. I think there was two security guards left on the, on the top floor. So instead of f***ing about, we just went, well, you know, we went upstairs. We claimed one each, me and my pal, and brought them back down. And then, and then uh, we then had to find um, a, the sort of uh, electrical um, um, uh, points where we could go and turn, take a, uh, the circuit breakers out to take all yeah, the cameras yeah. out on the floor for the, for the private security company. Yeah. So we eventually found that because the place was, it was vast, it was massive. So once we found that, we pulled the breakers. I went downstairs and said, ready, steady, go, pull it now. And my mate pulled it out. Then all of a sudden the, the telephone went off and it was the security company. Uh, we've got all our cameras have gone down, what's going on? And I said, 
I said, um, oh, we've had a, a, a surge in the mainframe computer system. All our, all our systems have gone down at the moment, but our tech guys are on now. Uh, we'll be up and running within 25, 45 minutes. Um, I'll give you a call back. And, you know, at that moment, I thought, is, is he going to take this on the chin? Is he just going to accept it? And he said, oh, no problem. And that was it. Boff, he was he put the phone down. So with that, I, called, I, I got on, the, on the, the, the radios to the guys across the road. Is it come in? It's all clear. And, and they all came across. Uh, my mate then took them up to the room where they were supposed to do the, do the yeah, business. Right. Um, the, re the reason they called it the Ocean's Eleven is because we had 20 um, bags, with, you know, the, um, the washing bags. Yeah, so, yeah. We, you know, they took them in with us and, you know, every every five or ten minutes, or, you know, they would come out with two bags. So on visually, it looked like, you know, loads of bags. Yeah, yeah. So they went and done that, what they were supposed to do. Uh, and then the, the guy, uh, we took him to the, the server room and he went in there and done his stuff. He left him in there to do what he was going to do. And it was da download data. I don't know how he done it, but that was his job. And then we went right back to just securing the building, make sure no one was already eyeing us. Um, because, uh, you know, the, the worst thing about being in our game is, is to worry about being on a ready eye. Because, they, you know, there's a shoot to kill policy for robbers in England, in London in particularly. Yep. Um, you know, so the decisions that we, we make are not taken lightly. You know, um, it's, they're either a lifetime in prison or, or death sentence at the moment, you know, for armed robbers. However, you know, you know, didn't really give it a second's fault, you know, because of the, 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 you know, the, it was the game that we chose. Um, I think most days we didn't really care whether the jobs were easy or whether they were hard, uh, whether we wanted to do them or whether we didn't. It was just, it was just a job for us. Um, I think uh, it was uh, an emotionless, um, faultless discipline and a reaction to the way that we lived our life at that time. We yeah, didn't yeah. really give a fuck, you know, we just wouldn't have done it. Anyway, getting back to the job. <laughs> Um, so everyone was doing their bits, um, and, and, and I, and I was, I was up looking up, up down the roads, checking all the cameras to make sure there was no one in or, out. uh, and, it, and, it, and every now and then a cleaner would come out one of the rooms. So we had to go and get them, bring them back and just cuff them up, explain to them that there was someone in the building who shouldn't be. So they, everyone was pretty good. They, they still believed that we was, uh, he was a real old Bill. Um, and then all of a sudden a uh, car pulled up outside just across the road and two guys got out of it. And I thought, oh, f you know, this, you know, my mate, my mate said, like, there's two guys, there's two guys, they're coming out, uh, they're heading towards the front door. I said, well, just take it easy, just take it easy. We won't let anyone else of our team know. Yeah. Just let them carry on with a job because we'd be on schedule. Then all of a sudden they came in, and they, they had their own bi biometric cars to get in. So I knew that as soon as they pulled them out, they they either, they were work there and they were technicians. They both had uh, uh, bags. So I said, just let them in, just let them come yeah. through. So he was doing something in the foyer. They walked past him. And as they got into the lift, I said, if they come to my floor, come up to me and we take them out. We take them out as they come through the lift. However, they went up and they, and they went up to a different floor. So I said, just keep an eye on them and do not let this out of your sight. Just make sure they don't come down to our, our, our floor until we've run out of there. So he said, no problem. So done. So they went to their floor. Then all of a sudden it, it sort of calmed down. And then I'm, I'm watching on the CCTV cameras and I'm seeing all these bags. It's like, you know, yeah, 10, yeah. 12, 14. So I know that as soon as it's, you know, we're getting to that time. So I, I, we, I think we had about about 10 or 15 minutes to go. And I'm, you know, we're just, you know, you're just, just trying to kill time. You're looking, you're, you're walking past. All I can hear is a dog barking, you know, and going in there and say, like, you know, we've really, we've done a sweep of the top floor where we're going to come down to the second floor. Everyone just calm down. And they're just, they're, they're talking amongst each other, all the security guards. And uh, they're still to that, that, that moment, they still thought that we were real old Bill. So, so it was, it was about, you know, it's about keeping them appeased and also just making it look like we're, we're doing the job. So every, every five or 10 minutes, I just went in there and said, it's okay. My, my dog, Anna, was still there anyway. He was still standing there with the dog. So he yeah. no one was going to come past him anyway. Yeah. He, was, he was six foot four. He's built like a shit ass and he's got a massive big old station. So no one was going to attempt to you know, come out of there. Yeah, Plus, they, they was all handcuffed. So we, they can't we, do nothing anyway. No, we, we tied them. What we did, we tied them all to the stairs. We said, like, you know, as much as we, we don't want to do this, you know, if, if, one, if one of you are rogue, we have to tie you up and we have to, we have to really uh, make sure you can't move. So, you know, we're sorry about this, but, you know, you know you're know going you're gonna to be tied up to you know, that, uh, that stair rail. And it was okay. It was all, it was all good. They was actually laughing. Um, anyway, the next thing, it was, it was about three minutes to ten, and I'm thinking, right, let's go. The last couple of bags come out. So I said, right, let's go. We're going to call it now. And so everyone grabbed their two bags. Uh, me and my other pal carried three because the dog owner couldn't carry his because he had the dog. dog. The dog was just f***ing. It was a great big 
thing and it just kept jumping up and doing shit you know what I mean barking <laughs> uh, so so he we let him go first thing he went out in the van and everyone just went put their stuff in the van the specialist came down he disappeared we never, I never even spoke to him you know he just went in, in his car he, he went the, 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 the technicians our technical guys they came down so well done they went in they, they went and got in their cars they put the, 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 the bags of stuff in our van and then they disappeared and then I called it let's go we're going to shut it up and then everyone just walked out and then we just shut the doors and then we we we, we got in the van and we just drove we, and it's, it was really funny because like you know your adrenaline is going and you want to you want to smile you want to pat each other on the back but everyone's really quiet you know every, everyone was really like you know we still ain't got out of this we still got to get yeah, out yeah, of here of course so we're driving at Kentish Town and just as again as we came level with uh Holmes Road police station car sirens came on all coming out of Holmes Road there must have been six seven cars vans everything else and it was all blue lights and we were stuck there we was all in police uniform and all I, all I could hear again with my mate what's going on what's going on what's going on and, and he, he said um, I said it's okay I said they're not on us they're going to the Verizon you know so with that we, we let them pass and we drove it to the next exit and then you got a back exit towards uh homeless road and there was just van loads and van loads and van loads coming past us and we thought we were getting penned in there. Yeah, yeah and then we just sorted all i could see was blue lights and flashing lights everywhere and we just we just trying to keep calm so we uh, they went past us and we drove up uh, we, went, we got a level with um Hampstead Heath, yeah. and then we I, we let my my guy at the back with a dog. He had to go and take the dog home, <laughs> or take it to someone who, who who it belonged to. Uh, and I remember him getting out. He had a full uniform on, but he had a, a, a Mac, and he had this dog jumping around. And he walked into the darkness in Hampstead, and then we we carried on up the hill. We went to our slaughter, dropped off all the motherboards because that's what they, we had to get them secure. Um, and then we went. We went and got rid of the cars and all our clothes. We gave them someone. They, they got and shot them for us. And then we went out for the evening. We had a, we had a little drink, a little <laughs> celebration. And then uh, the next day, we had arranged to meet our fixer, the guy that fixed yeah. it. So, so the job was, to, we met him in Kenwood. There's a, there's a big Kenwood house, you know, Kenwood. And there's a little restaurant there, but there's a big car park. So what we did, we parked a, a, a van we had with all the motherboards in. Uh, we parked it there and we left the keys uh, in uh, the petrol cap. Yep. And and um, I went in and spoke to him and uh, he, he, he said, I've just heard it on the, on the news. He said, that was brilliant. That was superb. He said, no one got hurt. No, no one got hurt. You know, there's no scream up. As far as they're concerned, they just, you just nick some other balls. That's it. I said, yeah, lovely. And he, what he did, he fired. He, we had some accounts set up in Dubai. Yep. And, and what he did, he, they fired all our money over a boff. And then um, we got a confirmation uh, from from a friend of ours, Boff, and here everything's landed. And and we said like the, the, the stuff's in the van in the car park. See you later. And that was it. And that was, then, it. And that was it. We just I walked I walked back to, uh, with my pal and we we parked a uh, he parked a Range Rover. We had a Range Rover. He jumped in a Range Rover and I said I'm gonna I'm gonna have a walk down Hampstead. And I walked down Hampstead Road, and uh, that was it. We were done it. You know, so it was a it was a, it was a it was a nice bit of work. And did, at that point, did you realise how much you had stolen? Or did uh, you not just believe you stole just like motherboards, it was worth five million, etc. We knew you... we knew that the motherboards were worth in excess of five million, if not more. Uh, but we, we, were, we were told that the, 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 the stuff that had been uh, downloaded could be worth hundreds of millions. We, we put a, a, you know, a rough guesstimate, a hundred million, but it could have been hundreds of million. You know, he was in there for an hour uh, loading stuff down. You know, um, you know, uh, you pick a number and it could it could exceed whatever you think. You know, we yeah, had no, we, you, you know, we had we had we had J P Morgan, R B S. We had some of the leading banks in England and America. What's going on, guys? This video is sponsored by London Steel Services Limited, based in Hertfordshire on the A10. No job too small, no job too big. Anything to do with metal, these are your guys. Make sure you hit up London Steel Services Limited. All their information is on the screen right now. They offer crazy lead times, 24 to 48 hours on builders, beams, and small fabrication jobs, flatbed and 45 to 90 foot crane high up deliveries. The jobs they get involved with are barn conversions, extensions, loft conversions, new builds. They can survey, design, supply and install steel, or simply just supply. Whatever you need, they're here to help. Uh, that man, did you ever speak to him again? Um, my fixer, yeah. Of course, Not the yeah. fixer, the... Uh... Specialist. Oh no, no. You know what? I I I I met him uh, for a, uh, a minute. I told him exactly where he needed to be. If he if he wanted to come in this job, that's where he needed to be. That was my only conversation with him. There was no need for me to have a discussion with him or get to know him. 
yeah. the whole idea was for him to be at that point at A and for me to take him to point B and take him in there to do his job. And as soon as he'd done his job, his job was then the f- out of there. <laughs> uh, at the same time, you know, just a, a few months before this job, there was a job done in America, uh, in Chicago, yep. uh, a, a level three facility over there. Uh, the guys, uh, the, the, the guys had done that job went for a wall, uh, and 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 took a load of stuff, uh, a load of data. That was job number one, and then the, um, the job number two was in the um, in the city uh, where they went in and nicked some biometric cards, um, the same cards that uh, I think that we're using at our job to get into all the all the mainframe computer rooms. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, it was, it was an organised. It definitely was an organised um, attack. Attack. And was your jobs only ever in the UK? You can't answer that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, listen, it's my job to ask the questions, yeah. right? Do you know what? Yeah, you know, I, I, can, only, I can only go, you know, because, uh, you know, America have got an extradition uh, process that, that yeah. is, is, is limitless, I, I presume. It's but not- no, we never done any, we never done an American job. Um, and we never done anything else apart from that one. You know? <laughs> no, listen, and you got caught for that job? Yeah, I got caught uh, a year later. How? Yeah. You know, as anyone ever got caught, um, um, a, f- a friend of mine who, you know, in that, it's a very small world in our game. So someone uses an MO, other people start using it. And what happened, people started using uh, police uniforms to do jobs, yep. not very successfully, and not as successful, as successful as us. However, they then started using police uniforms. Uh, one of them was, was, a, was a, a good friend of mine, you know, you know, no one's got, no one's got the, the, the um, the market, as far as you know, what you wear and disguises. So you know, fair play to him. It, it wasn't Dante. It wasn't his fault. He went and used a police uniform. Uh, when he was arrested, they'd done known associates, and mine and my my other my other pal got nicked with me. Two of us out of the ten of us that were on that job, only two of us have ever been been convicted of this. Okay. However, they'd done known associates, and they showed my my photograph to a load of um, security guards around England. Apparently, there was quite a few jobs at that time. I think you know, twenty or thirty jobs. With police uniforms, and yeah. uh, I think I was picked out by 30, 30 different people. Um, but luckily for me, uh, the MO was a dog. So our, our, um, our MO op- operandus uh, was was a dog. So they couldn't really do me for them because if you change your MO, you either got one MO, you're going there as police officers, or you're going there, your MO is with a dog. So because we had used a dog, that was my MO. So they only could charge me for that, not the others. Which I was quite relieved about because you know I was looking at some serious years. How long was your court case? Um, it only went on for a couple of days. Uh, I, I, in the death, I went guilty. There was there was there was a there was a mounting of evidence. You know, um, you know, ideally, you only get like you know for no guns, you're looking at between nine and ten years, eleven years max. So you, with with good behaviour, you're out in six or seven. So you know what, it wasn't worth pushing it. So you know, but if I'd have gone guilty, I'd have got an extra third, blah blah blah. Um, however. While I was waiting there, I was in Wandsworth and I had MI, MI5, I think it was, or MI6 came up uh, in there. And the reason I know this is because I got pulled out of my cell and they said, like, you know, there's, there's a police are down there they want to speak to you. When I got down, I asked them where they come from. And they said, like, you don't care about, don't bother where we're f- from. That was the exact words. Don't worry about who we f- are. All we want is we want the mother boys back and we want the kids that set this job up and we want all the data back. And I, and I, and I said, who are you? You know, he said, I told you, don't worry about who we are. He said, what I'm prepared to do right now is I'm prepared to make a deal with you that you could walk out tonight. You can, you can be with your kids because it was coming up to Christmas. You can be with your kids. You can go home. All we want is the people that set this up. You're going to go. And I went, no, nah, that was it. And that was it. He said, right, you're, you know, you're, you're going to regret this. And I went, whatever. And that was it. He went. Anyway, after, oh, they, I spent about an hour with them. You know, they, they were really, yeah, yeah, they were, they were really <laughs> tough. They were like, you know, they were, they, they, were, they were akin to SAS. They were, f-ing, they were quite intimidating. But I was quite fit. I was in, in the gym every day, um, and you know, it's you know, they they really put some pressure on me, uh, and you know, they tried every little tactic apart from physically beat me. You know what I mean? However, they talked about my kids. They talked about my dad. You know, to say what, what was prepared to happen to my dad and be arrested. Uh, my family would be persecuted and everything else. Everyone that I loved and everything would be f-ing hassled. And I just said, you know what, you do what you got to do and I'll do what i got to do. And that was it, you know. So clearly whatever data was on that was some serious data. I, yeah, you know, if, you know, it was uh, just a few months afterwards, a big crash happened in 2008. Now, if you think that lots of lots of data about them, you know, prime mortgages, because the prime mortgages, they were giving out like confetti, knowing full yeah, well yeah. that the people that were taking them couldn't pay back. 
However, each one of them bankers who were in that sector got millions and millions and millions and millions of pounds. So compared to what we took was was minuscule. Yeah, they earned millions, and that, and the inf and the data that could have probably convicted them was 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 stolen, unfortunately. You know, and it was. Listen, from what you're saying, it's definitely over a hundred million pound worth of. Data. I would, I, I would, I would, I would, you know, yeah. There's, there's no, there's no limit, it's, you know. But, but if you, if you also put the fact in, is that if that information would have come to light, there'd have probably been a run on the banks because of of the corruption that was involved. That you know, these people earned hundreds of millions of pounds, billions. Yeah. You know, and no one's ever been convicted of that. You know, and and you know, as, as taxpayers, the tax people, the taxpayers have had to pay for all that. Hundred percent. We bowed at every bank in in, in, the, in the world, you know, but no one, no one went to went to prison, even though they knew it was illegal. But unfortunately, on the technicality, it wasn't breaking the law. But they all knew it was illegal, so they earned hundreds of millions of quid, and we we took a few, we took a few million, whatever. How long did you get sentenced to? Um, well, they, you know, as I said, they 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 had to get their pound of flesh. And, and and I was supposed to get nine years, and, and which I did, and then they gave me a consecutive sentence, and they knocked it up to 16 years, nine months. Wow. So I got the same as some, if I was carrying a gun or I killed someone. And what uh, did you, how long did you do behind the door? I'd done eight, eight years, four and a half months. Wow, it's a long time behind the door. Do you was know that your what? first ever time in prison? No, I was, you know, I've, I've been in care, a care as a young kid, and then I think I was in, uh, in my, in my when I was 18 or 19, I got four years for a load of armed robberies. Uh, in my 30s, when I was about 35, I got nicked for a, for a, a couple of kilos of cocaine. Um, I was in a, I was in the vicinity with someone uh, got nicked with it, and unfortunately, uh, I got I got pulled in with it, and I got six years. Um, but you know, we we kept under the radar. You know, we wasn't gangsters. We didn't mix with other criminals as far as um, going out to the same pubs, clubs, and all the same bollocks that goes on in that world. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were just straight guys. We we, we had families, um, we had businesses, and we came together every now and then. And we we uh, we earned some money. So one question I do want to ask you, I want to obviously ask about prison, but I want to also ask, why didn't you move to Dubai? You had money there. You could have gone there and lived well, it's, a very. It's just, it's just, it's really, uh, you know, you've got to have a, an account in Dubai and to get residency. You know that. Yeah. Um, but you know what? You know, we're talking in 2007. Dubai wasn't like it Boy, is it now. Was. You know, it was, it was, a, it was an alien country as far as we were concerned. Spain was the place to go, yeah. and unfortunately, the extradition process over there was a change so you can get extradited back. So you know, uh, plus I, I also had family back in England. I got a big extended family. I got, I got, I got all my kids here in London and in England, and I, want, I wanted to be near them. So, for me, it was just about living the life that I wanted. You know, I'd like, to, I'd like to work one day a year, and 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 spend time with my kids. You know, uh, I I can remember. You know, I, I think I mentioned this in in, in a couple of podcasts I've done before. As criminals, we 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 never ever say goodbye to our kids when we go and do a job. So what we do is we actually. A couple of days before, is we take them out, we take them to the zoo, we take them to a restaurant, we buy them everything they want, and that's a, a, a bit for us is about saying goodbye, because we never know where we're going to get shot or yeah. where we're going to get a life sentence. So every time we go on a bit of work, you know, I had this sort of this this thing I used to do, I used to take them out, and I used to show them that I was a really nice guy, which I wasn't, you know, uh, but it was about showing them that Daddy was a really nice guy, and if anything happens to him, remember the good time, not necessarily all the bad times. Um, but saying that, you know, that life wasn't really, uh, was, was the best life. You know, what started as something that was really romantic and really, uh, you know, really, really, uh, really something I, I wanted to aspire to as a young man, uh, turned into a really shit life. You know, I had, I had, a, I had, I had two lives. I had, the, I had a family life with my kids and my daughters and my sons and everything else and my girlfriend. Uh, and, and on the other side, I was going out. I was, different, I was going with different girls every night, uh, different relationships. Um, you know, all I wanted to do was get in this game and earn lots of money and, and look after my family. But unfortunately, that life and, and what it brought up in me was, if you work hard, then you got to play hard. You know, you take drugs, you do, you get involved with, with different organised uh, groups, yep. you know, and they, they like to enjoy themselves. They work hard and they want to play hard. And then all of a sudden, I found myself in Amsterdam, living now, um, um, importing, exporting stuff from now. Then I found myself in Cambodia. Then I was doing cigarettes in uh, France. You know, I moved about, you know, in loads of different places, different circles. But, you know, what started off as something really good, you know, turned into something really bad as far as uh, my criminal lifestyle. So obviously your team, let's just say, yeah. over all the, whatever it is you've done, however many jobs you've done, I don't care, that's 
for you and you to know. You made a lot of money. Towards the end, was it even the money or was it the adrenaline you were chasing? It's always the money. You know, you know, people people often say, oh, you know, I really, I really enjoy doing robberies. I really enjoy fucking getting hurt. I really enjoy fighting. You know, I, I don't really know anybody that really enjoys getting hurt, yeah. or, or I don't really know anyone who, who actually is seriously in this game says, I done it because I get an adrenaline buzz. You've got to be a fucking moron. But the Verizon one must have been as much as you made loads of money. Great, that was amazing, and all that. Finishing that job when you all left there, you must have thought, oh, we actually yeah. smashed it. Oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it, was a, it was a brilliant, it was a brilliant bit of work. You know, it took a lot, a lot of organisation, and you know what? You never get that back. The camaraderie that we had, we were a really close team. You know, we were really t- together. We was we was in each other's pockets for years, uh, and we we done some really good stuff over the years. Did you ever you know, work with other teams? No. Nah. That was your team, and no one was allowed to work yeah, with anyone no, else. That was it. You know, we we were, you know, we we all done our separate things. We had our own businesses. You know, we was in. A, we was also into other stuff. You know, export, import. You know, but you know, every now and then you get something offered to you, and you, you know, it's a challenge. You know, for me, it was like, you know, I, it wasn't because of the uh, the adrenaline, but however, there was a certain amount of uh, satisfaction and, and getting one over on the banks. You know, um, and there was also a certain satisfaction of, of, of getting uh, one back on the old bill. Yeah. You know, dressing up as the old Bill and taking a dog and being one of them, you know, was was quite exciting for me. You know, because you know, I'd, over the years, like you know, I got I got my ass confiscated on the poker. You know, process yeah. of crime act once, and they lo- I lost my ass there. Um, and I, you know, I sort of resented the fact that they'd done me. But we have a certain respect for the old Bill. You know, they doing their job and we do our job. But I always felt a little bit aggrieved that they took my f-ing ass, uh, and and I lost another one. So for me, when I when I fought with this idea, a part of me was saying, you know what, I really can't wait for them to look at this, and then and then really get up their fucking noses as far as like we we're dressed as old Bill. There was that. There's a sort of power thing when you put a police uniform on, and then you walk into a place and we, we were five-handed, you know, we were we were hard we were hard guys, you know, we weren't fucking around. We didn't use violence. We didn't take any guns. We were all capable guys. You're professionals. Yeah, but you know, but to walk in when we did and see all them security guards, it was it was good because you know, as I said, you know, once you know the psychology of most security guards, most of them are either ex-old Bill or ex-military, and one thing they respect is old Bill. Yeah. So, so there was that. It was a massive adrenaline buzz as far as like we was on. You know, I'm six foot one. I was I felt like seven foot tall when I was in. There. You know, I was larger than life. You know, I was I was ordering these guys around. You stand there, you f- come over, you come with me. You know, it was like we weren't. It wasn't like you know normal. Yeah, you know, yeah, excuse me, course. come over here. You come with me now. Come around here. We was hard but fair, and then you know, but you know, you're going through this for an hour. You know, you're trying to be hard but fair. You know, and and when you walk out of there, and you you still got that adrenaline rush, and you get to where you're going. It took a while for uh, for us to come down, but we did laugh. And you know, I'm not going to lie, we we went out for a drink that night, and we we drank to about three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock. Um, and when we left, when we left there, everyone was patting each other on the back and saying, that was brilliant. You know, like, you know, guys, that was, that was superb, you know, however, that's it. You know, we, after tonight, you can't say nothing about it because that's our job. So we have, we have a kiss and a cuddle. We all pat each other on the back and then they went their way, then free. I went back to the, to my mate's gaff and we stayed with the, with the, with the motherboards and, and the next day we gave them out and gave them back and they were out of the country that evening and they were gone. And only two of you ever got charged for that? Yeah, just me and him, me and him, yeah. Yeah, it was unlucky, unfortunately. But you know what? It's I say like I say that. I really do say that, you know, it was it was unlucky at that time, but probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Go in prison? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. In what sense? Um I, I you know, I was away with with uh, some really good guys, you know, while I was up in uh, I was I was up with uh, some real good some real heavy guys. And I was up in uh, rugby and uh there was a couple of armed robbers there. They was in their sixties, one was in their seventies, and they were talking about all the jobs they'd done. And and uh, and I was with these these um, these other guys. I'm not going to mention anyone's name, but they, you know they're really 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 well known within the criminal fraternity. And and we we got on like an ass on fire. You know we 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 had to go. We had jokes. And I was away about a year and a half by this time. And I was sitting there thinking, you know what? I was watching these young kids listen to these old gangsters, and and talking about armed robbers. And I thought, these guys are in, they're 70 years old, you know, and they're looking at they're looking at dying in prison. And I think oh, I don't want to be like that. Yeah. You know, I really don't want to be like that. So, so when I got nicked for this, I I had to go on an ID parade. And and what happened 
is that they they they, they put a special squad, you know, eight man team down to pick me up from the prison. Yeah. And then they took me to uh, they, first of all they took me to Highbury and Islam, but it was shut. And then they took me to St Anne's ID ID suite. So as we as we came out of there, they put the cuffs on me, but they they put them on wrong. They were they weren't they weren't very tight. One of them. So we're driving up to St Anne's, and and I'm I'm, I'm in the back of this van, and I'm and I'm, I'm wedging away. And the next thing the f-ing things come off. And I'm thinking, God, I'm I'm out of here. I'm gone in a minute. And so we got as far as St Anne's, and the, the police car came in, or the car, plane cars. There was all two two plane cars and a, and a van. One car pulled across, and they no, no one got out. The other car pulled behind us. I thought, lovely. Then the guy who was driving the van, he walked in and pressed the doorbell, and he went in. And I'm thinking, I've only got two mugs with me now, because I always had this voice in me, just. Do it, you know. What I mean, I've yeah. always had a good voice and a bad voice, and this is the one that always gets me in trouble. <laughs> and, all I, and, all, and all I and all I and all I was taught was to think, F- just whack him on the jaw, you know. And I kept thinking, well, with the door open from the inside, or does it have to be open from the outside? It's got kid locks on it, or whatever. And I'm thinking, F- now, then the geezer behind me started reading the paper, and then the other one just opened the door and stepped down. I thought. Lovely, boff! I'm just wading one. I knocked him straight down <laughs> on the deck, and I've got jumped out of the van. I've got one cuff on on me, and I'm running around the corner. But there's the old Bill come through the gate, and I run back. Now by this time, all the old Bill have all oh, what's going on? All getting out of the car. Yeah, yeah. So I've jumped on the car, and I've grabbed all this, uh, jumped onto the wall, and as I'm just trying to pull myself up, the the, 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 Cuff. the cuff's stuck in the wall. And I'm trying to pull myself up. Next thing, someone will whack me across the head in the truncheon. Uh, next thing, I got whack in the back, and I'm, I'm landing on the floor with all these old bill and bam, bashing me. And I've got a busted eye, broken, uh, three broken ribs, and, and a thing, and then I'm, I'm up. And I know, all I can remember is my, my barrister coming through. Because <laughs> I had a bad, I, looking I, at I, you I, having all this I, and, and I said, and, and anyway, they cuffed me by the same. He said, what's, what's going on, Sherry? And I said, I said, look, I said, I just got out of the van. They just jumped me. <laughs> and and, and, he, and he, he went, no, listen, I don't want to see any, any of my, my, my client in damage or anything. So, so they said, look, he tried to escape. And we're taking him back to the pri- uh, prison now. So I went back. So I got, I got in there and, and I, I had to go and see a doctor. And, and with that, he said, like, you know, we know that you tried to escape. I said, I never. I said, they attacked me. <laughs> um, and then he said, like, you know, look, you really need to go and speak to someone. I'm going to recommend that you see a psychologist. A psychologist. <laughs> so I went, all right, mate, no, no problem. So they put me in a jumpsuit, yellow and green, escape suit. And, a, and about three weeks later, I got a knock on the door. Some bird came to the door. And, um, you know, I was bored. I was banged up on my own. <laughs> I had to take all my clothes off every night and chuck them out. So I, I couldn't have nothing in my cell apart from cockroaches. Um, and then all of a sudden this, this lady comes and, and uh, we start speaking and over a period of time because I, I was put in a home as a kid you know and I you know as a young nine nine or ten year old kid I've, I was taken into a home and left it and that was it you know so I, but I always normalized it I never actually said anything about yeah, it to yeah. anyone anyway so once I started speaking to us you know a lot of issues come out about being abandoned yep. but also going into care the people that were tasked to actually look after me and care for me uh, tried to beat me into submission you know, I can remember going to a care home. I think I was only, I think, ten years old. I remember walking there, and my mum, my mum was there, and my 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 um, uh, social worker, and they both left. And the next thing, uh, they, I said, like, I don't want to be here. And the next thing, this kid whacked me straight in the face. And there was three of them, and then a couple of women, and they all put me on the floor, and they was whacking me, and it was like saying, calm down. I thought, I ain't done nothing, but they were whacking me. They were really f-ing whacking me. Anyway, I stayed there for a few months, and then and then uh, it was deemed that I was I was not someone you could. F- with mm-hmm. you know so what they did they then moved me to a place called Stanford House and when I got there I, I thought that place was bad this place is 50 times worse you know I was I was one of the only white kids in there it was just in Shepherd's Bush you know um, and next thing I knew this another kid just come and whack me in the face he said like there was three of them he said if you don't give us all your tuck on Thursday or whatever it was he said you're gonna get this every night the other couple of kids that came with me this one they, one of them got pissed on that night and they beat the shit out of him I thought you know where have I just arrived however over a, over a period of weeks, I settled in now. It became normal, and then I got someone stabbed me, uh, stabbed me in the back, and um, and so what I did, I took the knife off him. Uh, an afro comb, it was sharpened up, and I stabbed him three or four times in the head. Uh, and then after that, he left me alone. But from there, I went into a community home, and then and then so going into prison was like normal for me. Yeah. I never felt as I, you know for me when I walked inside prison, it was like it was like being at home. There was nothing that it held for me that could frighten me. So what age was you when you went inside for the long stretch? I, 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 think, um, I think I was I was 18, 17, 18 years old. I got done for a load of robberies. 
Uh, for the long one, how, how old was you when you went in for um, Verizon? Oh, no, Verizon, I think 45, 45. So was, when you're, was when you're at that age and going to prison, it's a lot more relaxed, no? Oh, yeah, you're in a different different world. You know, when you're in the young offenders, it's, like, it's, it's hard work. You know, you're, you're trying to compete for who's a top dog. And yeah. it's, it's like, it's a, it's a f***ing shit world. However, you know, you're, you know, you're in, in with people like you. But I just, you know, instead of, instead of t- uh, rehabilitating you, it just makes you, it just corrupts the life out of you. It makes you hard, it makes you antisocial, it makes you, you know, you withdraw, you know, you isolate yourself. However, what it also does is makes you more available once you get out because now you've turned into a monster because now you're doing weights, you're fighting. And you know a lot more criminals now. Yeah. So, so, you're, so for me, when I came out of prison at a young age, I was actually open, uh, welcomed in, with open arms in the underworld simply because I could have a go and my currency was violence. But anyway, getting back, getting back to, to this woman coming in my cell, I started speaking to her. I realized that, um, that I had some serious issues as far as my thinking was concerned. I always thought I was right. Um, I, always, I always listened to this voice on my shoulder. It was really powerful. And, and, the, and the good voice that was on my other shoulder that was saying, you know, Terry, you don't really want to do this. You, know, you want to calm down or you don't want to yeah. I'd say, shut the f- up. However, you know, I started to listen to this one now, and this one got a little bit quieter. And I and I volunteered to go and see the psychologist, and I realised that you know I had abandonment issues with my mum and my you know my family and all that, and being in a home really with you know I was beaten you know everything you know and I and I, I bottled it all up for years and it made me really angry. Yeah. Um. And you know, adding to that, I had dyslexia. Adding to it, I was I never went to school. You know, I was just I was just a time bomb. However, I started speaking to her and I could feel that anger going a little bit and I understand and all of a sudden they moved me. But before I left, they said, look, there's an experimental prison in Aylesbury called Grendon Underwood. You really need to try and get in there to if you want to sort yourself out on this sentence. So I, I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a go at it. So I told all the boys, and they said, tell this place is the worst of the worst. It's the worst f***ing prison. I wrote a book about it called Living Amongst the Beasts. Yeah. Um, it's the worst of the worst. Uh, that, you know, you'll be living amongst the beasts. It's just Peter. on that there, that's this book here, right? No, the one at the back. This one here. Yeah. And if people want to get hold of this book, where can they it's get it? It's from? on Amazon. On Amazon, yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's, a, it's a it's my account of going through the through this through this process. Um, for what it was, so I, I went I went now, and it was really about to look at my behaviour, my thought processes, everything else. But it's probably one of the hardest places to go. There's, there's 228 of the worst criminals in England now. Oh, you know, we're talking paedophiles, rapists, serial killers, Murderous. wife killers, everything. And and what happens on each wing? You have a well, within seven days of being there, some guy got killed. <laughs> he got he got his head. And this straight. was the prison you wanted to go to. This is the prison I wanted to go to. He he got killed, but they have a policy there where you're not supposed to hit anyone. If you hit anyone, you get you get taken out of there. So this guy, instead of hitting him, he killed him. Uh, whatever. So that was his problem. So, so, what, so, what I, so what my idea was, was to go on the wing and actually, actually have a look at myself and what I was about. And I thought I'd wing it, you know, you got, you know, it was like one floor over the cookers next, there's music, there's, um, there's uh, aquariums on every landing. It's a, it's a really nice, you get gym every day. And I thought, this is all right. You know, I'll, I'll be here for a couple of years and I'll, you know, I'll kill a bit of time. But all of a sudden I had, I had engaged in the therapy and I remember, I'm, there was nine of us on a therapy group and 40 of us on this one wing all the time. And I had these guys that I was around, and uh, you know, listening to their stories, it, it sort of, you know, brought it brought back so many memories about being in care, everything else. But there was certain things that I didn't really understand. One was embarrassment, ego, shame, um, tolerance of other people, and and also able to articulate a response or a conversation to anyone. So I was I was really lacking in everything academically. I was crazy, no good. Uh, and my social skills were, were, I was so inept, it was unbelievable, you know, so going here was going to give me an, a, an opportunity to actually find out who I really was. Yeah. However, the place was a, a double-edged sword, you know, I can remember going onto, a, onto my group and, and being in the session and a guy came in and, because you have to be open now, yeah. so you say, you know, so what you are, I'm a robber, blah, 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 and this is what I'm in for, and they go, oh, thank you for telling me that, thanks for sharing me that, and all of a sudden this guy sat down next to me and with a few of us there and he goes, my name's so-and-so, and um, I was, I was splitting up. I was splitting up with my girlfriend, uh, my wife at that time, and I was going for a divorce. And I decided to kill myself. I had a nine-year-old girl and a, and a six-year-old girl, and um, they was all asleep. And I came back downstairs, and um, I started taking some pills, and then um, I had a drink. And um, about half past one in the morning, my daughter came down. She was six years old, and she, I was I was crying. I was really upset. He said, and I and I, I was actually feeling for him. I thought, you know what, you know, 
you can't be all bad. I didn't know what yeah. he was in for. <laughs> anyway, he said, next thing, she said, Daddy, Daddy, what? Why are you crying for? He said, I'm going to heaven. And she said, Daddy, can I come to heaven with you? And he went, yeah. And, I, and then the next thing, he said, I gave her a pill or a drink. And then it, this went on for an hour or so. And he said, next thing, she passed that, but she didn't die. So I went to the kitchen and got a bag. I put it over her head and suffocated her. And he said, then she's like scratching me and screaming and all that, which woke my other daughter up. But she died now. She died, the kid. Wow. And I, and, and I said, you, you f are real. So why do you kill her? He said, she wanted to die. I've got three daughters. Sorry. And I wanted just to, to kill him. However, you know, because I was in therapy and I was on best behavior, I just sort of sit with it. But I can always remember going back to my, my cell afterwards and, you know, I really wanted to kill this guy. I'm, I, I could feel everything. Yeah, of course. But if this was the first time in my life that I had to sit there and deal with it myself, first of all, I would whack him, I'd kill him, I'd do whatever. But I had to internalize it and sit with it. And, you know, as much as it was the worst place in, in the world, I sort of started learning about tolerance. You know about having to instead of reaction uh, reacting on the first first instance like i normally do i had to sit there i just i had to think about it and i went back to my cell and i started crying and and it, this was for me sorry this was the first time ever that i'd open that gate and and, and I, or that valve and um it just came out i started crying and everything else and um all i could picture was a little kid uh, and then over a period of weeks, you know, I met other guys. I met guys that killed their old families, killed their boyfriends, killed their girlfriends. So that really taught me tolerance because I was random now. I wanted to hurt them, but I couldn't. But instead of swearing at them and calling them names, I then started to articulate responses and ask them questions about what they yeah. did. So that, 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 that sort of, you know, triggered something else in me. My, I had a massive ego as a kid, you know, as a growing up, because I, I thought I knew everything. You know, as, as criminals, we have a we have a warped sense of uh, of a self entitlement. We think that we can take everything and, and do whatever. Um, and I, you know, and I started to realise that, you know, what I was done, what I was doing all my life was really wrong. You know, and there were certain things in in uh, that I learned about shame, about embarrassment. You know, people kill for shame and embarrassment yeah. and ego. And you know, and. I learned so much about myself, but most importantly, I, I learned about boredom. When I'm bored, I take drugs. When I'm bored, I, I have loads of different girlfriends. Because I was abandoned as a kid, I then equated as many conquests or sexual conquests to make, having love. So, you know, I, I, I'd be in relationships, but I, I, I was lacking that love. So yeah. I would then go out and find loads of different partners. Instead of working at my relationship, you wanted to feel loved, so you I wanted want, to feel yeah. it with everyone. So I never gave my partners a chance. I just went, so you know what? I've had an argument you next, next one next one next one next one so but to understand that now and realize what i was doing i you know it was it was it was it was, it was big for me because then i could then go back to my my partners and explain to them what i was like you know never never done me any good being honest but um but you, you know but i also had kids of all these my ex-partners so it was really about them understanding the process what i was like and what i've, what I've come through um you know i used to smoke drink womanize um, but doing therapy, and I never, I never went there because I wanted to change. Yeah. I got there because I, got, I went there because I got caught and I was bored. But for the first time in my life, you know, I, I used to self-medicate. I didn't need to self-medicate. I didn't smoke. I didn't take drugs. I didn't drink no more. You know, it, it actually by dealing with all them things in this place made me realise that I didn't really need all them crutches anymore. So you know, so it was, it was, it was the worst experience of my life. It's also one of the best experiences in my life. But the reason I wrote, I wrote the book because I there was a lot of, there was a lot of people there that I thought that weren't changing. You know, I was I, I had no you know I I just engaged with it and I just went along with it and I and I, I found it very beneficial. Yeah, it's not the cure that, that fixes recidivism or changes people. However, you do find a lot about yourself and how you work. But I also I also felt that there was a lot of people going, especially sex offenders, rapists, paedophiles, and everything else, were that were actually learning skills that would make them more proficient predators under the guise of being rehabilitated. So that's why I wrote the book. But see, it's about my journey. It's also about it's also about some of the people I met. But it's also about the stuff that I learned now: confrontational therapy, yeah. anger management, you know, everything, um, you know, art therapy, you name it, uh, um, psychodrama therapy, everything. I, I went through so many different things here. And, and by doing, engaging every single one of them, I learned a little bit about everything. And I think that was the catalyst for me to actually coming out and really changing my life. Uh, but it was, only, it was only through trying to escape and doing this job that I was actually given the opportunity to go in that, in that place for two and a half years. 
it was hell. I'm not going to lie, hell. Because I, 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 I listen to some horrendous stories, like you know, that I can't even repeat because they, they bring too much of emotion yeah, yeah, up in me. Uh, but you know, I wrote, wrote loads of them down. But it definitely, definitely changed my life beyond recognition. Well, the the fact that you've actually you can sit here and say it's helped you, yeah, yeah, yeah. that in itself says you've changed. A lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed, but they don't actually understand what they've changed about themselves. You can openly say, I used to be a, I had a massive ego, I thought I was a man, X, Y, and Z. I've met you here today and I can see who you was and now I can see who you are. And I can see that just through obviously doing interviews and speaking to people, you're a completely different person. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, as I said, I've changed beyond recognition. Um, you know, my, my criminals, I used to, I love all the guys that I work with. You know, I'd never, ever, you know, I'd never grasp them up. I'd never grasp anyone up. But we live in a culture nowadays where misery loves misery. And if people get caught now, they want to take all their friends to prison with them. You know, it's not like where we came from. We're yeah. a different breed. Old school. Yeah, we're old school guys. So, you know, but I love them guys and I, and I would do, I would do 10 years for them, and which I did. You know, so, you know, there was that part of me. There's also a part of me that, you know, that really believed in the criminal underworld, the criminal belief system and everything else. However, I did meet people inside that I met and said, do you want to tell me this? I went, yeah. And they said, yeah, I know so-and-so. He's a good mate of yours. I go, yeah, yeah. And they said, when I, when I, and the guy, actually, this is the story he said, I just finished 11 years in prison. I got out. And see your mate. I come out. Within two minutes, he said, come in. I've got a little bit of work for you. And he said it was 30 or 40 grand that evening. Yeah. And, and I said, let me stop you for one second before you go any further. I bet he said he's got a job for you. He can't do it himself because he knows the area, he knows the people and everything else and it's going to come on top for him. But I hear drive. And he went, yeah. I said, mate, he ain't your friend. He's a f***ing parasite. If he was your friend, he'd give you some money and let you go and see your family. But what he did, he came out here and offered you a bit of work so you could feather his f***ing nest. So part of me hearing his stories... And, and seeing what I've seen in, in that prison and other prisons um, just made me realise that maybe that life for me wasn't worth continuing. And especially where you had kids as well. Times are different. You're not an 18-year-old boy who's out there living the best life. You've got no worries in the world. Now you've got, you said three kids, right? I've got, I got three, three girls and two boys. So you've got five kids in total. Yeah. And I can probably, that's all that matters to you right now, no? Yeah, yeah. You my, couldn't my, give a shit yeah. about the money or anything like that. Do you know what? I, I, I came out of prison. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm on my last year, I became a born-again Christian. I'm not one of these people that chuck religion down yeah, your throat. Yeah. I don't read the Bible. I don't even go to church. But I got baptised. And for me, it was, about, it was about saying, right, I had a quote from one of the people that I was, I was doing a, uh, an alpha course with. And they said, listen, Terry, all you have to do is, is do one thing. And God will ask you this. Come to me and let me do the rest. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'll come to him, but I'm not going to f*** around doing all the Bible stuff <laughs> or anything else. However, what I will do is I will get baptised and I will, I will embrace that and I will do good. Yeah. And so I got baptised and it was about getting rid of the old me and creating a new me. You know, sometimes you've got to fake it to make it. Mm -hmm. And what I did, because I'd done that, I was then surrounding myself with people that were Christians, yep. you know, all different faiths. So, you know, Christians, Muslim guys, everybody. I'm, I'm talking people that had really changed their life around because they, they wanted to do good. So I then came out of prison. Um, I then, I started working at a food bank. Yep. You know, I'd never do this. I'd never done this thing before. I worked at a food bank. I, st I started a knife crime campaign up, uh, Change Your Life at Daniel Knife. Uh, I worked for that for a few years in Camden Against Violence. Uh, and then I met the most I met the most wonderful girl who I, met, who I live with now, Anna. And she's a, she's a teaching assistant. Uh, and I've been with her six years. You know, we got, we, we got a little place in Hampstead. Uh, we got two dogs. And... and and, and we have such a great life by just walking over Hampstead Heath every day with the dogs. I go running in the mornings. We have, we've got a little gym as well. We do a little workout, both of us, not too, not too much, not likely when I was a kid or younger. But we have a little workout together. We go for a run and we go for walks, which is really great. And then, and then in the daytime, I, I work with one of my daughters. We started up a, a business it was called Scoff yeah. Mills. Uh, it's, it's a food prep company. Um, um, and we've been doing that for the last five years. And we've grown it from, you know, working in her kitchen having three or four people working with us now we've got 14. Um, amazing yeah and we so got, you've definitely changed your life around you know what my, my life is blessed my life is seriously blessed um simply because I, you know because I, I i made a conscious decision to, to do it you know is, is, you know you could listen to all the people that have been rehabilitated in prison and it don't mean f all yeah you can listen to everybody's uh, hindsight 
and you're not going to get their hindsight because no one ever listens to people's hindsight. You know, if, if you know, you, if you ever listen to yeah. someone who's telling you about, you know, don't do that because of, because of blah, 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 you don't listen. You have to make your own mistakes. I've made so many mistakes in my life. Yeah. Uh, so f for me, it's a really, I've made them all, I accept them all. So for me now, it's just moving on to this different next stage of my life. And that stage equals doing good, not bad. And do the police still cause you headache or? No, no, we have, I have a, I have a great relationship with the police. Yeah, <laughs> they've left you alone now. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, as much as I hate to say this, you know, I never ever disliked the old Bill, even when they nicked me. You know, I can remember that uh, when when I I was up in Luton when I got nicked for this. I can remember walking along. I was actually on my way to uh, Luton Airport to pick up my passport to go to Thailand. I was going to stay over there for a couple of years, yeah, yeah. and and uh, I can remember coming out of my place. All my gear was already packed. I was going that evening, and I had arranged to pick up a passport. And I was walking out the road and I was going to get something to eat and then I was going to go back and then get a taxi and then to the airport. And then and I was walking up and all of a sudden I'm on the phone to one of my pals down in London and the next thing a car came across the verge and there was a brick wall there and I went, oh, f***. You know when you that realisation is old Bill. And as I turned to the, to the behind me, another one come behind me, then a van came and I, f***. Oh, you know, and I, I tried to jump up because they, 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 I thought they was going to smash into each other. And I rolled over and the next thing they was all on top of me. And then, and then, and then uh, there's about 25 of them, and then, and then they, they got me, they cuffed me, and I, was, I said, "Look, what's going on?" Yeah. You know, they said, "You're not a terrorist, blah blah blah." He said, Hold up this picture, because what happened? You know, because because I, I was quite big, but I, when I was on the run, I'd lost a lot of weight. I was training yeah. instead of doing like weights, I was doing lots of running and everything else. Apparently, a job had happened while I was on the uh, before I got nicked. A job had happened, um, and. Um, the real old Bill had turned up on the job. Yeah. And this guy had come out. That's he, fake old Bill. Yeah, this fake, fake cop had come out of his place and had nicked a load of money or whatever, yeah? Um, he'd come out and he'd gone whacked his old Bill, smashed him, put him on the deck, and he grabbed the old the other one and threw him over the wall. But what both of them said is that the guy, who they said was me, was six foot four and built like a shit ass. Yeah. So when I got arrested, they were holding this thing up to me and they kept saying, he's a lot smaller than we think. So in their own words, they just said like, you know, they, 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 they thought this guy was me, but it wasn't, you know what I mean? Uh, but by saying that, they couldn't arrest me because I was only six foot one. So in their own, you know, they tried to get out of whatever they were doing or whatever by saying this guy was a monster, blah, blah, blah. And in their own words, they condemned themselves because when I got nicked, I'm only six foot one. So uh, anyway, so next thing, I'm, I'm being held there. They put this picture up for me and, this, and they, they, all they kept saying, was, you're, a lot, you're not as tall as we thought you was going to be or big. And I said, you've obviously got the wrong person then, didn't you? I said, my name's Eddie O'Brien, yeah? And I had ID and everything to that name. And, and, and I said, look, get my ID. My ID's in my pocket. You've got the wrong geezer. And, and, and they were like, for a minute, they were thinking, have we got the right guy here? You know what I mean? I'm thinking, well, they f***ing, come on, please, just let me go. Just give me, give me, get me out of these cuffs and I'll be gone. Anyway, next thing, no, they, 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 that's, that's, that's another guy came, no, that's f***ing him. That's definitely him. And I'm standing there and I, and I said, look, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm going to say nothing else from this moment on. That was it. So I was, they sat me on the corner for about 25 minutes, but they were talking to me. They were really nice. You know, they didn't yeah. really, really do me, do me any damage. And they said, you're going back to Kentish Town now. And I thought, oh, here we go. Now, I, I remember driving down the motorway because it was, it was about six, seven o'clock by now because it was getting dark. And I thought, this is the last thing I'm going to see now for, for a very long time. And I was, you know, I was looking and then all of a sudden I see an armoured van coming up. With like old Bill at the back of it and all, and I'm thinking, F hell, man, ah, oh, I'd have been blind if I would have done that one. You know what I mean? And then, and then, <laughs> well, I was, and then we drove past it, but I can always remember coming back to Kentish Town Police Station, and as I walked in there, they were all like, ah. <laughs> "You got the bastard!" Fuck and they yeah, chucked man. me in the cell, and that was it. You know. Well, yeah. listen. One thing I do want to say is, on the way up here, I was talking to Harry as well, and I was so excited to hear your story. Yeah, and. It is your story is ten times better than I even expected to be. Oh, Genuinely, I always say to everyone I come on the podcast. I never ever watch previous podcasts of people. I don't ever want to know what your story is because then it's well, what am I interviewing for? It's a waste. If I know your story already, I, what do I want to hear it again yeah. for? And they need to make a movie on it. They are. I'm, I'm actually doing the one with uh, with uh, all the line pictures. Uh, hopefully next year we're going to start filming. Wicked. It's great, and I think it will be. An unreal movie. Well, you know, I wrote the book, you know, The Art of Robbery. Um, this one here? That, this, that where's this available? That's, it, that's on Amazon. Yep. If you just go to Terry Ellis Books, uh, there's free. There's, a, there's, a, there's Living Amongst the Beasts, so The Art of Robbery, 
yeah, and 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 the final countdown. So it's it's like a trilogy of books. Um, one when I done the job, one when I done therapy, and one was the last year of of, of a, a decap prison. Well, um, listen, I think your story is amazing. As much yeah. as it is breaking the law, oh, of course, it's a great story to tell. It needs to be turned into a movie. And listen, all I can say is. You're definitely a changed man. I don't think you're an egotistic guy. I don't. I don't see that side of you. I genuinely think you're a very nice guy. I think you are. That's the truth. I'm, no, no, I, don't, yeah. I don't bullshit. Just to close up the the last bit of this podcast, can you explain to us? Did you know the police were even onto you? Did you have any idea they were after you? Did the boys let you know? Um, um, what I was, I was living in um, Queens Crescent in a, in a flat up there, or my girlfriend was my girlfriend's place, and um, I normally get up uh, half four every morning. You know, I'm normally up at the crack of dawn uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and and I, I went to the, to the balcony and, um, and I looked out, I looked out, just looking over. I never, I never put my arms in. I was, just, I was just standing there. I just looked over and I saw a, a bird walk past. And then, and then I saw a guy walk past and I just thought, you know what? It's just too early for them. They, they just don't look right. Mm-hmm. And, and then I, I, I thought I went in. And I, I always had, I had a rucksack with 30 grand in it. And, and um, I, I ran in and grabbed hold of that. And, and I jumped up and pulled myself up onto the onto the roof because mm-hmm. uh, it, was, it was on the top. It's like two floors. It's three floors for three three landings, and we're on the top floor. Two 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 landings. I pulled myself up onto the roof and I ran all the way down. It's about it's about I've done 150 yards on that. And I went. There's a little uh, a ladder that goes down, and I went down that, and then I jumped 15 foot onto the floor. And as I as I got, as I landed on the floor, I walked back round and just checked out the road. And as just as I came out, there was about 20 old Bill all going to this flat, and I thought. You know, I was really lucky that was, and then I and then I went on the run. I thought, you know what? Because I, 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 cause I, what I did, I threw my phones and everything. I don't, yeah, I didn't got in contact with anyone. I just threw my phones away. I knew that was on me. So what I did then, which was which was crazy of me, I went and hired out a canal boat, and I put it in Camden Town. And I, believe it or not, where I parked the boat was right at the back of Verizon. It was actually there. I was there for three months, <laughs> and I didn't fuck it. I didn't realize it at first. I parked out because it was the only space I could find. And I looked over. I thought, I was a horizon over there. But I thought this is probably the only place on God's earth that they won't look for me. So I parked it there for three months and then I moved and then I see my kids in Hampstead and blah, blah, blah. I met, we, met, we had a little special code where I met them. Yeah. And, and then I moved up to Luton and then I moved up to Northampton and I rented a little cottage and, and I met, you know, just, you know, I just had little, little birds everywhere and I was going to the gym every day and I was just living life. And then all of a sudden I, I came back to Lee Grave to get my passport uh, to meet him at Luton. And you know what? You know, I wanted to get out of England so I could I could start a new life. Unfortunately, they were waiting for me. I don't know if it was the guy that actually was doing my passport or whatever. He swears blind that it wasn't him. Uh, it was just one that it was a fluke. Yeah. But um, but you know what? Saying that, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me that I got caught because as much as people think you're going to go away for ten years or whatever, it's not the end of your life. You know, it was the beginning because I started writing. I was dyslexic and I started writing. So it was really good. I started writing poetry because I was so, prison is so boring. You know, all this stuff you see on, on television about PlayStations and everything else and watching, f-ing, you know, watching a few channels every day. Blah, blah. You know, it soon become really re- repetitive and boring. So what you do, you start doing things that you wouldn't normally do. So what I did, I started writing. I started reading a thesaurus. So my vocabulary got a little bit yeah. better. Uh, I then started writing, because uh, what I did, I started writing it and I, I, when I read it back, it was, it was quite repetitive and I thought, well, you know, you're, you're using and and you're using the same words all the time so I went and got a thesaurus and I started reading that and, and then I sort of got a love of words so that then brought the creative side out of me I also had a, a little a little Zenko phone little phone I had yeah and, and and I used to talk to my kids every night where before when I was out I'd be lucky to talk to them once or twice a week because I was always doing whatever I was doing they was they was kids yeah they came in they went to bed they went to school and I went out and, and everything but, but what I did I, I found myself phoning them every single day you know, talking to them for hours. So my relationship was so bad with them, I think, at the beginning. Um, even one of my kids now actually calls me Terry. You know, but my t- my, my boys are okay. They 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 all they moved out. They, you know, uh, the three girls that live in London, they've all got kids and they've all moved on. And they're really great, great kids. None of them have ever been in trouble. Um, the two older ones accept me for who I am because their boyfriends are villains. <laughs> or, they, or they were villains. Um, were you know, villains. So, They're so, not so, villains so, no more. So you know what it's about. My youngest one, even though her boyfriend, um, you know, he's he's been in prison. She started calling me Terry, and and then that was quite. That, I found that quite uh, disconcerting when I first came out. 
However, over the last six years, we've built a really good relationship. I see her every single day. You know, I have her kids over, um, and I'm, I'm, I've become a granddad. You know, I'm, I'm a granddad. I've got 11 grandkids now. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so, you know. Big so, family. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying being a granddad. I'm enjoying working at Scoff with my other daughter. Um, and it's, it's just a real, and I enjoy being a Christian, you know, and I enjoy meeting really good people and having a conversation. Well, listen, all I can say is it was a pleasure having you on the show. I think it's been, and I always say this, but this it tops it every single time. Probably my best podcast yet. And I think your story is amazing. Genuinely, I think the best part of your story is as much as you've done, estimated highest value of 100 million is you. Your change in yourself is worth more than 100 million. Like going from being, not to be rude, but a shit person who just wants to make money to... If you could probably trade all of that in and have more time with your kids, you probably would. You know, I was, I was, I was quite lucky because um, they never found any of the mother boys and they never got any money back. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, on that note... That's another story. <laughs> on that note, that'll be part two. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for coming on. Guys, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. And go buy his book while you're at it. Have a read. Let me know what you think of it. Bye-bye.